This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Our goal at Everyday Tech is to keep your technology not only working, but working for you. I'm the host, Abram Naney, and you can join me and my friends Wednesday mornings at 10 on MPB Think Radio. Or search Everyday Tech on your favorite podcasting app or download the MPB Public Media app. From MPB Think Radio, this is Creature Comforts. It's the show all about your animals and the animals around you. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. Recently, many of Mississippi's state lakes have reopened after renovation. This, coupled with the coming summer months, means the lakes are prime for anglers and boaters. So today we welcome back a Creature Comforts regular, Dennis Rickey, fisheries coordinator with the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks, who's going to tell us about the renovations and what you can do to renovate your private ponds and lakes. Also, as always, Dr. Major is on the line ready to take some pet questions. You can email animals at mpbonline.org. Just a reminder that if you ever miss Creature Comforts on Thursday, it repeats every Saturday morning at 6. So good morning, Libby. We always like to start off by finding out what you've been seeing in your yard at least recently. Uh, thank you for asking, Kevin. Uh, there's been a lot going on in my yard, and um, as I've, I guess we talked about a little bit last week, this is the time of year when um, most of our backyard birds, particularly the neotropicals that migrate, they're breeding and nesting and feeding babies and lots of stuff. So, oh, I need to get closer to the mic, sorry. Uh, but uh, so it's a real active time in everybody's yard. And uh, one reminder probably is this is a really good time for you to keep your cats indoors. Baby birds are really hard for a lot of cats to resist, so it's a, it would be a good time to, to be very mindful of that. It's their one chance to reproduce all year, so we want them to be successful. That said, we were um, we f- we follow several of our neotropical songbirds when they come back to what we consider their home. They may consider South America their home and come up here just to have their nests. I don't know, but. Uh, Yellow-billed cuckoos have, uh, are a bird that we really like to hear, and we very seldom see them in our yard, but we hear them, mm, you know, pretty much all spring. And this year, we had a pair decide to nest right in front of our house, at, right at eye level for Paul. So he got to watch the nest, and they were just it's a bird that's generally considered secretive. That's what it says in the bird book, and they have always been that way for us until this year. So anyway, our yellow-billed cuckoo's nested. It's a big bird, and uh, but they are known for being one of the birds that are able to nest and raise their babies quickly. So they're they're they're. They're, the babies grow fast and they fledge quick. So we knew it was going to be a fast ride when they started laying eggs in the front yard. And we got to watch through the whole system and they fledged successfully Sunday. Two babies left. And we've been hearing them in the yard a little bit ever since then. So anyway, it's been, it was great fun to get to do that and to document it because we were able to photograph them. And then after... The nesting was over, and we saw that they weren't coming back to use the nest anymore for a second nesting. So we um, were able to examine it a little bit, and Paul noticed this morning that they had woven. It's a pretty simple nest with twigs, you know, kind of a platform that bows up a little bit, and it's lined nicely. And then, but above it, uh, Leaves had been kind of twisted and turned, and little um, branches had been bent and moved so that it was protected from the rain, (laughs) which was pretty cool. So obviously when the babies were in there, that was happening too. And uh, the nest was, he said, almost completely dry after even all that rain. (laughs) So I thought that was a pretty cool little twist on it because they make a very simple nest. You know, a lot of birds will do something real complicated, but theirs was simple so that was fun and then my other I got some good pictures of a red admiral butterfly which is one of my favorites and they're out this time of year it's a a butterfly that is territorial the males set up territories 
and the females reportedly will only mate with males that have been able to secure a territory. Mm-hmm. So that matters to them. Well, that's and, smart. You know, yes. if you're going to mate with someone, make sure they've got their stuff together. That's for and sure. And so I did a little more reading after <clears throat> seeing that because I thought, all right, why? what's going on here? What's the advantage there? But the stronger flyers, and this is a, a bird that does, I mean, a, a butterfly that migrates. It doesn't migrate as far as the monarchs, but they migrate south every year. So um, the strongest flyers and what they think the healthiest mo- uh, butterflies are the ones that get the best territories. So then it starts making sense. She's trying to look for a fit, you know, set of genes here so we can make good, strong babies that can <laughs> yeah. migrate, I guess. So if that's what she's looking for in a mate, then she wants the guy that's got a good territory. And even in that tiny little butterfly body, she's got enough of a brain that can instinctively tell her which male butterflies <laughs> got a territory, huh. which is pretty interesting in yeah. itself, isn't it? And I always go back to we've got these giant brains that obviously we don't take full advantage of. We've been told that, but it's I realize that every time you in nature when you see how much a little hummingbird knows and how many decisions it has to make correctly. And we can say it's programmed to do it, but that's a pretty small little programming chip in there, isn't it, (laughs) in that tiny little head? And then when I look at the butterfly, the red admiral's even tinier. There's just not much head on there for there to be a brain, but there's enough brain that they know how to migrate and how to get back and how to find their host plant. For the babies to be successful in a red admiral family, they have to be on um, stinging nettle or false nettle or something mm. else that's closely related in that nettle family. So um, the adults are able to find those to lay their eggs on. So on <clears throat> NPR, I think it was earlier this week or maybe last week, they had a thing where the um, I think it was their investigative reporter was being interviewed and uh, there was this odd sound, a metallic drumming sound. And so they investigated, wanted to find out what it was. Turned out it was um, a woodpecker on her chimney while she was trying to be on the air for one of the reports that she was doing. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So and this one was, I mean, this was really a loud banging, but it, I thought about it and it's like, you know, <clears throat> I had one, my, my downspout a lot, so I've not heard him. So I'm looking forward to maybe uh, hearing him in the near future, but it was an interesting, um, you know, that, again, and that's one of those where kind of marking their territory and also advertising to the female uh, woodpeckers that they're available. So I always thought that's interesting. And again, I guess that's a choice. They've realized that this is a human-made downspout. They're, you know, they, they didn't evolve using a metal downspout to make noise. But when they realized that they could improvise mm-hmm. and use that to make even a louder sound, than they, and if they can't find a hollow tree, then they can drum on your downspout and impress the, the females. And... I guess, try to intimidate the other males. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, bringing your cats in this uh, time of year, and I think we have a caller uh, that wants to comment on that. So we say good morning to Jeremy, who has called us from Mobile. Good morning, Jeremy. You're on the air, so go ahead. Good morning, all. How are you all today? Good. Good. Okay. Um, so I, I uh, got to witness firsthand um, a very sad thing last night. So... Uh, I will skip the gory details. Uh, it was kind of like National Geographic, and there's nothing you can do about it. But we have a nesting pair of uh, barred owls in my backyard, and they found somebody's cat. Oh. So keep your cats inside, y'all. Keep your cats inside. So that's uh, the opposite. The, yeah. The cat may exactly. have been. Yeah. yeah. The owls have to eat, too, and, and Mommy and Daddy had to teach them how to hunt. Keep your cats inside this time of year, y'all. Please. All right, Jeremy, thanks for the call. That's interesting because uh, I think Libby and I both might have assumed it was one way, but that's that's another reason why to keep uh, stray cats, or not stray cats, but outdoor cats uh, inside at least p- during this time of year. Uh, which uh, brings up uh, Dr. Majors with us uh, from his clinic in Jackson. Dr. Major, how difficult is it to keep a cat that is sort of an outdoor cat maybe indoors temporarily? You know, it can be difficult. Um, A lot of times, uh, cats that are used to going outdoors are going to, you know, 
kind of be belligerent inside. They may not use a litter box routinely. Uh, they could uh, just really worry the heck out of you trying to get back outside. But in reality, the best cats are going to be inside cats. Uh, uh, no feeling. I see all kind of figures about songbirds that have killed this year. We don't know the exact number of that, but there are many. And uh, the feral cat population in most areas is pretty high. But if you can keep your cat in, you can uh, avoid some problems. And you know, the whole thing of curiosity kill the cat is very, very real. Uh, cats that are outside are exposed to a lot of things. Uh, other cats, cats that may have disease, uh, cats that want to fight. A lot of unneutered male cats looking for a fight. It's just to be fighting, I think and protecting their territory, if you will. But, yeah, I would recommend keeping your cats inside. Uh, and while we got you here, um, we're going to be talking about lakes of Mississippi during the hour, and uh, I don't think cats would like to go to the lake, but I imagine a lot of dogs would. Uh, any thoughts for pet owners, dog owners, to keep in mind this summer when they start taking their, their dog to the lake with them? Great, great question. Uh, a lot of times we think of uh, the water as being great for dogs. You know, it's a great thing. They have a great time. Remember this, uh, and, and I think this is true. I've always seen more heat stroke prior to July the 4th and after. I think our outside dogs have to get somewhat acclimated to the heat. The humidity has been terrible in the last week or so. It's better today. Uh, but when you're at the reservoir or body of water, it's so fun to play the frisbee or throwing a bumper out in the water. The dog goes and gets it, brings it back, back and forth, back and forth. And they can overheat even though they're getting in the water, so be careful with that. The other thing is to know your lake and know the water. Uh, there could be, we get up quite a few alligators in uh, Mississippi and the streams and lakes. And always be careful. Snakes are abundant uh, around water. Uh, especially the water moccasin. So be aware of that and realize that your dog could be at risk uh, in, in the lake or around the lake. And also I would think dogs kind of get tired out from running around playing just like humans do, so you're going to kind of keep an eye on that as well. Right, the heat. And, you know, even though they're going in and out of the water getting wet, we have seen dogs have heat stroke because they are overheating uh, over exercising and some of these uh, days can be fairly brutal with the heat uh, so be careful most cats don't have to worry about them in the lake uh, there are a few cats that there have been records where they like to uh, fish if you will usually they don't get in the water to do that but they'll sit there look and see a fish or some other creature and can actually catch it with their paws this is true around uh, some of the koi ponds that uh, people have, uh, have to be careful there because cats can definitely uh, the fish uh, in those core ponds. Uh, we do have a caller on the line. Our friend Kathleen looks like she needs a butterfly identification. Kathleen, what do you have for us? Well, I don't know. That's why I called you guys. It's uh, me. It was on the larger side, but it wasn't like a swallowtail. I was just sitting out taking a break from being in the kitchen. And uh, it came and landed right on my knee. And I was just so surprised. But then I looked at it, and it was like a chalk finish, a matte finish. It was charcoal. And it had on the wings, like, uh, an a area on each side of a turquoise. And then under that, layers of, like, a sage green. And then, like, a blue and little dots of black. And orange, you can see me around the like little circles, and and all the way around the body was like a silver tip. Like you took a paintbrush and just kind of barely caught the edges. And I said, "No, that's a first. I've never seen one like that." I think uh, look up a red spotted purple, a red spotted purple <laughs> butterfly. Um, all the iridescent, some really cool colors, and sometimes at the first time you look at them, you might think it's a swallowtail because it looks a little bit like a black swallowtail. Um, check that butterfly out and see. It's a really cool one. 
Right. But uh, I, I was fooling with something in the kitchen, and I had honey uh, <laughs> on my arm, and it, it crawled up to my arm, just sat there, and I'm going, as long as it doesn't bite, and I've never known a <laughs> butterfly to bite. It wasn't on yes. my terror scale, but it felt a little creepy, but I, I didn't want to scare her, so I just let her go, and yeah. she finally flew off, but... That was an experience, I'll tell you. Well, I think that was a red-spotted purple butterfly. Uh, our guest today is Dennis Rickey from the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. So, Dennis, you've got some really, I guess, exciting news about some of the state lakes in Mississippi. If you would, give us an update on things. Sure. So, um, there's about 18 state fishing lakes and about 20 state park lakes in, in the state. Um, they're basically uh central and south mississippi and like in the northeast there's not but um one um state park in in the delta uh but in the delta you have a bunch of natural oxbow lakes so from periodically from time to time and and this what i'm saying applies to your ponds too uh if the fish population is is not what you want it to be uh, or if you have problems with your dam leaking or your drain pipe leaking, maybe have shoreline erosion, you may have an abundance of aquatic vegetation that you really need to get to get rid of. Um, you might want to build a fishing pier. Uh, you might want to pile up some earth and make like an earthen fishing pier. Think of it like a short levee like that. So these are all reasons why we would renovate or close a state lake, drain it, uh, and and um, do from some facility improvement. Um, so the, the most common reasons are we've got a problem with the dam or the dam structure or that um, the, the fish population is just – you know, a bunch of small bass. That's not what the clientele wants. Or uh, maybe, you know, that we want to introduce a new species at the beginning uh, to increase its chance of survival, such as uh, a crappie. We'll do that. So um, recently um, we've opened uh, Trace State Park, okay, and that was a, a, a drawdown to uh, – to do some work uh, and treat some vegetation and, and do some restocking work. Uh, but um, last week, we opened Elvis Presley State Fishing Lake near Tupelo. And um, we did that. Uh, we first opened up it up only to youth, you know, under, under 16. So they had their day. You Saturday uh, was uh, May 18th, and they could be, you know, co- of course, accompanied by an adult, but the adult couldn't fish. So there was, um, I think it was 400 and something kids there. Hmm. And uh, then uh, three days later, we had the general opening, which was Wednesday, uh, May 22nd. And what typically happens uh, during these openings is uh, the catch rate or really uh, the catch rate of fish is really phenomenal because um, they have not been exposed to, to baits or lures. And so uh, they're kind of naive. And, um, you know, it's, it's, this, it's the springtime. Uh, they're cold-blooded animals. And so... Um, as the water temperature warms up, they get more active. They need more food. And so um, we had a really good crowd out there, both bank and, and boat fishermen. Um, you know, we did law enforcement checks on licenses and boat registrations and uh, life life jackets and all that, st- all that good stuff. Um, and uh, we did what we call a creel survey, and the name creel comes from a basket that uh, fishermen used to have uh, attached to their belts, and they would put the fish in the basket. And so, or you could call it an angler survey. Uh, what were you fishing for? What did you catch? What did you keep? Uh, how would you rate your fishing experience? You know, where did you come from? 
uh, what's your age, you know, get all the demographic information, and then we analyze all that. So, um, you know, you, you could do the same thing in, in the fall. Uh, people draw down their ponds to do work, to, you know, clean up vegetation, to dry it out, maybe draw it down so you could walk on the bottom and, and build a fishing pier if you wanted to, build gravel beds, uh, you know, where you got uh, landscape timbers or plastic pipe around the outside filled with gravel, and gravel's the the the, um, the preferred spawning substrate or bottom material for a bluegill and bass. And they'll, the males will, you know, use their fins and and make a depression, and that'll be their nest. And and, and the female will lay the eggs in there, and the males will guard the eggs until they hatch, until they're a certain size. So. Um, a state lake opening is really an exciting time, and, and it's a great time to catch fish. Um, catch will will drop off after that, but it's still a great great opportunity for some quality fishing experiences. Now, before we go any further, I did jot this down because you mentioned right before we came on air, this weekend is free fishing weekend, I think you said? That's correct. So every year uh, we have National Fishing and Boating Week. It's always the first week in june and it takes in you know like two weekends but the first weekend of national fishing and boating week uh, by state law is a free fishing weekend in mississippi so this saturday and sunday june 1st and 2nd you can fish without a license and without any state fishing lake or state park lake permit at the facilities that we operate uh, for free. That's for anybody. And it applies to both saltwater and freshwater. And then on July 4th is free fishing day. So you can fish. These are these are for residents now, just for residents. The same thing applies to National uh, Fishing and Boating Re- Week. It's free for residents. Uh, on July 4th, you can fish, residents can fish in freshwater and saltwater for free. But if you go to a state fishing lake or state park lake, you'll pay the, 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 the daily permits unless you have an annual permit. So don't, lack, don't let lack of funds this weekend prevent you from going fishing because you don't need a license. And what a great way to add to the July 4th holiday. Go, go do some fishing as well. So that, that sounds like a fun time for sure. Yes, yes. Uh, before we take our next break, as we were talking about uh, renovating and reopening these uh, these lakes, uh, wh- talk a little bit, if you would, about the restocking process. I think that on a previous visit, you told that it's it's kind of a longer, but you, you want to give the fish a head start, I guess, almost. Yeah, there's a, there's a proper sequence involved. Um, the first thing that we do is we stock the brim, which would be bluegill or red ear or shell cracker. Okay, those are the common names. We stock them in at um, usually at 500 fingerlings, two or three inch fish per acre. And um, then the following spring, we'll put the largemouth bass or Florida bass in, into, the, uh, into the lake. Um, the sequence uh, is designed so that by that first summer, after you stock the brim in, some of them will be big enough to... Uh, be reproducing and produce um, young, very small fish that the bass will be ready to eat. Hmm. You know, after you know, two three inches, bass or you know they, they switch to strictly um, well insects and um, little fish for food. Uh, so that's what it's designed to do. You can stock uh, minnows at the rate of five hundred per acre in the fall with your um your brim catfish can go in at that time too the bass are stocked at a a a rate of 50 50 bass per acre and these are the rates for unfertilized ponds we also put crappie in in some of our state fishing lakes uh it's difficult to manage crappie in in a small pond but um if you crowd the bass up you can you can have some harvestable size crappie but they're very popular in state fishing lakes. 
Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. Our guest today is Dennis Rickey from the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. And you can always email the show by sending it to animals at mpbonline.org. Before we jump back into discussions with Dennis, we do have a couple of phone calls. So first, we'll head to Horn Lake, and David is on the air. Good morning. Go ahead. You're on the air with us. Uh, yeah, I'd like to ask a question about uh, lakes and access. Uh, we used to have a lake uh, just south of the Mississippi border right off of Highway 61 called Lake View. And it used to have a, a paved road, had a bait shop, a uh, fishing pier, bait fishing, and, and a boat ramp. And we had that massive flood about 20 years ago. Uh, they shut everything down, and now you can't fish there. I'd like to know, uh, is there gonna, are there any plans in the near future or a long-term future to uh, at least allow you to uh, bank fish from there? Because that's a real close asset that I used to use all the time, and now I can't use it. Yes, sir. I know the situation well. Um, the loss of that private ramp, pay fishing ramp there, and the loss of the lease that we had uh, was um, a real source of disappointment to a lot of people. But if we, if the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks doesn't own land on which we will build a public boat launching ramp, or we don't have a lease, uh, from an individual to build a, a ramp, or there's no private uh, uh, pay ramp there. Um, the adjacent landowners can prevent anyone from getting to that state water. And that is what has happened in this case, and no one wants to sell us any land. Uh, it's owned by some people out of Memphis. So Lakeview, Horn Lake, even though it's public water, uh, you can't get access to it by land. What about the Mississippi Levy Board? I see. I, I used to hear all the time about Mississippi Levy Board. They got the levy going there, and for the flood control, don't they have something to do with state or government access that we can't? Uh, they are not required. Back off of that? They are not required to provide government or, or public access. But that might be somebody that you could appear before their board sometimes and ask for things although the way dennis is looking i'm thinking that's already been done i think we have asked uh, my colleague has yeah. investigated that possible option solution to providing public access there all right uh, david thanks for your call this is creature comforts on mpb think radio up next looks like we've got a pet question for dr major and it comes from lisa who's in hattiesburg good morning lisa go ahead Good morning. Um, we recently uh, got a rescue dog. Uh, he's nine to ten months old, the best my vet can tell me. And um, my husband and I both follow like a keto diet. We're trying not to eat as, as much processed food. And I would like to do that for my new dog, but ordering like the farmer's dog or something is kind of price prohibitive. Where could I find recipes, or how how would I know the best way to feed my dog something that wasn't processed? Great. Um, that's a great question, and it really is difficult to do. If you're willing to cook for your dog, uh, there are some recipes. You can go online and find some recipes that would fall in line with what you're talking about. I don't know if you've looked already or not. Uh, I do understand that a lot of these boutique and well-advertised foods are very expensive, as you said. As far as the other foods that are processed, in general they're good foods, but there may be some people like you that are trying to do uh, non-processed foods. And I would suggest going online, looking uh, at the different recipes that are available, and I think you could do that as far as cooking for your dog. That might be your best bet. All right, Lisa, thanks for calling in this morning. Our guest for this hour, Dennis Rickey, we're from the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks, and we've been talking about some of the state lakes in Mississippi. But, Dennis, I know it's a subject we touched on, I think, the last time that you were here as well. Uh, but the, the, the problem of invasive plant species in our uh, waterways in Mississippi, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, um, 
Well, there's a new book that has come out. Uh, it's authored by um, Dr. Wes Neal. Uh, the, the, he's the unit leader for the Mississippi Cooperative Extension Service, Wildlife and Fisheries. Dr. Gray Turnage, um, he's at the Geo Resources Institute at Mississippi State University. He does um, many things, but one of the things he does is uh, test herbicides and in little tanks and also in field trials and surveys areas for aquatic plants. And so um, we get calls from pond owners about they've got a plant and they describe it as a grass or a weed or a lily and uh, it's taken over their pond and they want to know what to do and how they can treat it or it may just be in an area that they don't want it to be and we had some old treatment sheets uh, going back probably 40 years uh, and uh, they needed to be revised and some of the chemicals were no longer available so finally, we uh, were able to get some funds from our um, state uh, aquatic invasive species management plan and put together this uh, nice book uh, that's spiral bound and it's got glossy paper and you drop it in the water and it's not going <laughs> to affect it. And, but the neat thing about this book uh, and is that they were good plant treatment books. And they were good uh, plant ID books, but they were never in the same book. So the beauty, one of the beauties of this book is that there's color pictures of different plant forms, uh, you know, a landscape shot, picture of a flower, picture of close-up of the plant, its growth form, and it tells you about the plant, and then you flip the page, and it gives you the best treatment recommendations available today. And instead of uh, a treatment recommendation like you read in a, a chemical label or herbicide label, which is the law and which you have to follow, where it says mix X gallons of such and such with, you know, so many ounces of a nine ionic surfactant and 50 gallons of water. Well, practically, you know, for a pond owner, uh, do you have a 50 gallon container at home? Probably most people don't. You, you probably can get a five-gallon bucket from Lowe's or Home Depot or something. But what about one gallon? I mean, a milk jug is one gallon. So this book gives the treatment recommendations in one-gallon mixtures. And it also, the book also points out the wildlife value of the plant, you know, uh, do ducks eat the seeds? Is it good cover? Uh, what are what are ones that you can't let go? In other words, they'll become invasive. Or what are ones that will spread slowly? Um, and you know you don't have to worry about them unless it's you know bothering the area where you want to fish and you're going to get tangled up in it all the time. Uh, which ones are susceptible to cold? So you could do a fall drawdown, pull the water off of it, and, and the cold temperatures in the winter would kill it. Which ones will be eaten by uh, a herbivorous fish called grass carp? That won't reproduce in your pond. So it's all there. And uh, even so, you know, if I told, told you to go buy some diquat and, you know, you went into the store, I need diquat. Well, you can, you know, the Tractor Farm Supply, the uh, Farm Cooperative Store, Jimmy Sanders Feed Company, or even online, it's going to lead you to the trade name. Well, in the book, there are both chemical names and trade names in a table to help you figure out is this is this is product called, you know, Scorpion. Does it have diquat in it? And if so, what's the percent of diquat that's got in it? You know, there are different strengths, just like when you go to the store to buy Roundup. Uh, and so we provide the formulation that's, you know, uh, if it says a four-pound formulation and it gives you the treatment rate for that. If you've got a two-pound formulation, you need to use double the amount. So uh, it's a great book, and it's free, and you can get it at uh, – by calling any cooperative uh, uh, service office in a county, 
You can go on MSU Cares. You can download the whole book. You can download the two-page treatment sheets, you know, ID and treatment sheet. Um, it's going to be on a link on the uh, Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks website. So it's something that we've needed for a long time, and it's been very popular. Um, other states are wanting it. They're, they're using it in, in you know, uh, workshops and in aquatic plant courses. So uh, yeah, I it, encourage everybody, if you you know, to, to check it out and call our biologists or call your extension service office and uh, get some good plant advice. Because the key is, um, when I talk to people on the phone, uh, Libby may tell me she's got a grass in her pond. Well, there's really no aquatic grass, which she's probably describing as filamentous algae. So I need, the biologists and plant treatment people need to know exactly what you have to recommend the chemical that's going to be effective. There's no one chemical treats everything. This this book really is. I mean, I don't know any, anything about this, but it's amazing how thorough you as you said. There's the charts at the beginning of the of the book about the the various uh, you know chemicals and things that you would do. As you mentioned, some great color pictures, some really detailed uh, things about how to treat it. it. It's really, I would imagine, just just a great uh, book if you if you have a pond in in your house at uh, your house your, your your property that you own. So. Um, really impressed with that so dennis before the break we were talking about uh invasive aquatic uh plants uh but during the break we chatted and not all plants in your pond are bad that's correct and in in this booklet uh at the top of the page of uh the identification page for the plant it talks about native and non-native and it also has some comments about invasive now not everything that's non-native is bad. And uh, an invasive species is one that is, is or is likely to or is causing harm to the environment or to human health. That's the simplest definition. So um, everyone, I tell pond owners, they need to decide how much plants they want to have in their pond and where those plants uh, can be and what type of plants are they um, Libby might want a nice white water lily I do. with that <laughs> white flower floating on the surface with a uh, an egg yolk yellow center uh, she might want pickerel weed that has a nice spike of a purple flower I do I like those too <laughs> yeah. and, but she, she's not going to want it where she's fishing from the bank or within casting distance from the pier. But, you know, studies show that fish production, the best fish production you can get in a body of water, of course, depending on the size, is somewhere between 30 and 40% aquatic plant coverage. And, you know, why is that? Well, provide cover to escape from predators, provide shade, provide oxygen, and also provide attachment sites for insects and what we call epiphytic organisms, organisms that grow on the surface of other organisms. And so, you know, insects are part of the food chain, you know, and uh, all young fish eat them. So there's definitely, the book talks about ecology and the role that plants play, pay, play in the pond <laughs> ecosystem and ecology. So um, Justin's on the line from McCall Creek, and I think I can answer his question. He's asking for the name of the book, and it's called Southeastern Aquatic Plants, Identification, Control, and Establishments. It's a production of the Mississippi State Univers uh, uh, University Extension Service. And Dennis, you said uh, any of the county offices that you could get the book from, and also you could uh, download parts of the book from the MWDFP website? Is Or am I confused there? Uh, on the... Um MDWFP website under fishing and boating uh, there's a pond assistance link and um, there is a link there to the cooperative extension service publications and water weeds and yes you can download uh, the two page sheets for each plant you can download the whole book if you want 
So again, it's Southeastern Aquatic Plants Identification, Control, and Establishment, and it's done done by Mississippi State University Extension Service. So Justin, hopefully that answers your question. Um, <clears throat> So we got about five minutes left. Dennis, if you could, you know, uh, fishing is popular in our lakes, but I know a lot of people like to go boating as well. Remind us of maybe some of the basic boating safety things that people need to keep in mind. So you need to follow the no wake zones. And so that means that, you know, it's an area usually around a boat ramp um, where um, you need to think of a 20 mile an hour speed limit like think of being on a um a residential street you're not going to go the same speed as you're on the interstate or state highway so that's a no wake zone uh everybody on board has to have a wearable uh life jacket uh if the uh boat is over 16 feet you have to also have a throwable life jacket um, you should have a noise-making device, whether it be an air horn or a whistle, in case you get in trouble to, to make noise to, to, to attract the attention of other boaters. Um, if your uh, engine is an inboard engine, you have to have a fire extinguisher on board. It's best to always have a fire extinguisher on board, even if you have an outboard. You know, gas gets spilled and... Uh, you know, some people still smoke and, and all that stuff. And you've got electronic equipment. You've got batteries, you know, um, things like that. Um, of course, you have to have your boat registered for three years. And that provides an identification number that you get. You put on the bow, each side of the bow. If you were born, I think it's either 1980 or 1982 by some date. Um, you have to have a boater education course, which you can take online. It, it's like a driver education course, you know. Um, are you on the right side, left side? Who has a right of way when turn in? Uh, if you operate your boat at night, you have to have Coast Guard approved lights, uh, red and green on the front, and uh, a solid white light on the back to indicate where you are so that other boats can see you, whether you're docked moored or running around on the lake but um and uh watch your alcohol consumption mm -hmm. i've seen some terrible pictures of uh boating accidents and uh so um don't uh drink too much and try to operate a boat that's not never a good idea and also, remember to bring some sunscreen, I would imagine. <laughs> sunscreen, mosquito repellent, a nice hat, you know, if you're, you're going bald or you don't want to get sunburn and on water, your face. water, a jug of Water of ice to keep water. rehydrated, yes. maybe a snack, you know, yeah. All right, uh, so we got about a minute left, um, and I had something I was going to ask you, and now it slipped my mind. Any kind of final words here in, in the last minute of the show? Uh, I would encourage people to, to just to go outdoors and, and visit some of the, the, the nice facilities, whoever operates them in the state. We have to offer there's, there's riverside uh, camping opportunities, canoeing, kayaking, um, just go on a nature trail. And it doesn't always have to be structured. Uh, I read a study one time that the people who – they did the, the, the study with kids, and um, the kids said that when the, the best trips that they had were when they just said, okay, you got an hour, you can do whatever you want, you know, walk on the trail, you can do whatever you want, and come back here in an hour. It wasn't a structured program, and they just left to explore. That works for adults as well, I bet you, I'm, for sure. <clears throat> That's going to wrap us up for today. Creature Conference is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio with funding provided in part by listeners like you. To hear today's show or previous show, you can visit creaturecomforts.mpbonline.org. Our show is produced and engineered by Abram Nanny. So for Dr. Troy Major, Libby Hartfield, and our guest Dennis Rickey, I'm Kevin Farrell, inviting you to stay tuned up next at 10. It's autocorrect. We'll be back next Thursday at 9 for another Creature Comforts, heard only on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.